Welcome to Homegrown Florida. I'm Petrina and today we are going to be talking all about our little friend right here, which is cauliflower. We are going to talk end to end from seed to harvest, how to grow cauliflower in your warm weather climate, such as mine, which is Florida. Cauliflower is part of the brassica family, which is not the easiest plant to grow in a warm weather climate because they do prefer cooler times. <laughs> so we only have one time of year that we can grow cauliflower, and that is usually late fall to early spring with winter being prime season for growing brassicas. So this last fall, I actually started my brassicas, I think it was in August. <laughs> I do not recommend that. That was just a tad bit too early. Uh, September seems to be a great time. And then of course, October, November, and December are all really good times to start any of the brassica families, including cauliflower. My August cauliflower did uh, form ahead and they did grow beautifully. But for those first two months, they struggled because it was still incredibly hot here in Florida. Um, but I didn't really have a choice in the matter. I was going out of town for two months. And so I had to get them in the ground. I was pleasantly surprised that most of them lived through that. Uh, but the germination rate of those particular seeds were very low because the heat uh, of starting those seeds outside did not do well. Now, if you were to start them indoors in an indoor setting with lights or in an arrow garden, for instance, you might have better luck with getting them grown and germinated and <laughs> doing better than what mine did. Now, another thing that might be kind of a surprise to you when you're trying to grow brassicas or cauliflower in winter here down in the Southern States is that they actually take a lot longer than what the package says the days to harvest is. And there's a reason why. So as we move from fall into winter, the daylight hours become less and less. So we're getting into the shorter days of the years. It's, I think the shortest day of the year is called the winter solstice. It occurs in December, I wanna say the 21st, some, somewhere towards that end of December. Once that hits, then it switches and the days start to get longer. So what you'll probably notice is that when you start fall cauliflower, it grows extremely slow. <laughs> and then when you start cauliflower, say, in January or, or late December, you're gonna see that those grow faster because the daylight hours are expanding and they're becoming more versus in fall where the daylight hours are getting shorter. Less daylight means less sunlight, which means shorter plants that take forever to grow. So if your cauliflower or your broccoli or any of your brassicas take significantly longer than what the package says, just know that's normal. I grew two different kinds of cauliflower this year. I grew my tried and true snowball cauliflower. Works for me every single year. I was very lucky I stumbled upon it the first year that I wanted to grow cauliflower and it worked. So I haven't really branched out from that until this year. This year I actually started growing a um, purple cauliflower. It's called the uh, Purple of Sicily from MI Gardener and I wasn't really sure how this one would grow because it didn't really say anything about it growing in a very hot tropical climate but i thought you know what let's experiment we'll put our snowballs in we'll put our purple of sicily in and see which one does better and i have to say that they both performed amazingly <laughs> so it's really gotten me thinking about trying some different ones i'm really interested in growing some yellows and some oranges so next year you're going to see a kaleidoscope of colors of cauliflower but for this year, I stuck with the white snowball and the purple of Sicily cauliflower, which both did amazing. Although I do want to preface that the purple of Sicily turned out more like a broccoli than a cauliflower. The plant grew <laughs> like a cauliflower. And what I mean by that is it didn't produce side shoots like regular broccoli does. But the actual taste and structure of the vegetable was much more like broccoli than it was like cauliflower, but I think you'll enjoy both of them. Now I start all of my brassica seeds exactly the same, and that includes cauliflower. I start out with a seed starting mix and I start them in trays. You can direct sow them into the ground. I have found that when you are direct sowing them early in the season so that 
September, October timeframe, we still have a significant amount of pest pressure, especially cutworms. <laughs> so when I start directly in the beds for brassicas, um, I usually end up having a significant amount of loss because a cutworm will come through while they're still very tiny little seedlings and they will, what they do, they cut the stem and one day you'll come out and this little cute little seedling will have fallen over and it will be cut at the base of the stem <laughs> and you can't do anything to revive them after that. They are dead. So a lot of the times earlier in the season, I will start them in trays where I can protect them so that cutworms don't get to them. And then once they get about six inches tall, four to six inches tall, I will transplant them out into the bed. And at that point, cutworms are as huge of a deal because they can't get through the entire stem. Now, if they are making it through the entire stem, I have a trick where I will wrap the stem with a paper towel holder or a toilet paper roll that has been finished. So instead of tossing those in the compost bin, save those for your fall gardening. And as you put your transplants in, you can put paper towel holders around them and it creates a physical barrier around the stem of the plant. So the cutworms and the armyworms and such cannot get to it. When you start them in trays, you want to start with a very fluffy, soft, seed starting mix. You can buy seed starting mix. You can make your own. I have a video that I'll put down into the description on how I make my seed starting mix, but I've actually recently transitioned to doing um, pro mix as my seed starting mix. It is a type of soil that you can buy at, I believe it's Walmart or Home Depot has it. And it's very soft. It's very fluffy. It reminds me a lot of peat moss. If all you have is coconut core or peat moss, you can totally start seeds in that. Just know that you're going to have to add nutrients later on as they are growing. And the best way to add those nutrients are to find a liquid fertilizer that you can water your seedlings with that includes that fertilizer, something like Alaska's fish fertilizer would really do well. So once those seedlings get to about six inches tall, you're gonna transplant them out into the garden. You'll take them out of their trays, be gentle. I mean, their roots aren't super sensitive, but you don't wanna snatch them out of the tray. Just gently, you know, move them out of the trays, make a small hole and place the seedling in the hole where the uh, stem is at ground level. So you don't wanna bury it deeper than what it currently is or higher than what it currently is. Just right at the level at the soil. Mulch all around it very well and immediately, immediately water them. It kind of gives them that little extra boost that they need from transplanting. And if you're transplanting in the fall where it's still hot, I strongly encourage you to transplant them in the evening. I don't mean when it's dark, but when it's dusk. So starting around five, maybe four, five, six o'clock in the afternoon, put them in then and it gives them time to adjust to their spot at least until the next day when we get that full intensity sun that we get during that early part of fall. What you may notice if you transplant earlier in the day is your plants are going to look wilty and they're gonna look tough just struggling and tough and it's just they don't look happy those first few days. I promise you if you switch to transplanting in the afternoon versus in the morning you will see a way more robust plant the next day. The next part of taking care of your cauliflower seedlings is watering and fertilizing. When you first transplant them into the bed you are going to want to water them every other day until they look like they can hold their own, until they're not wilting anymore and they look like maybe they're putting on a new leaf, then you can start to back off. I water my plants once a week during this time period. I do use a lot of mulch, very thick, heavy mulch. I mean, layers and layers and layers of grass clippings, leaf litter or dead leaves, paper even, shredded paper. I mean, pretty much anything that you have, mulch heavy and mulch thick. Don't be afraid to really cover up the ground. That's going to be what keeps that water in the ground so that you don't have to water as often. Now, during the winter, we start to get into a time period in, in my area where we start to get a lot less rain. That has not been the case this year. We have had nonstop rain all winter, which is very abnormal. Um, so I really have not watered these guys. <laughs> the rain has watered them. But if I was in a normal season, <laughs> that is typical here for Florida, I would be letting my sprinklers run 15 minutes once a week on this particular bed. And that would be enough to take care of this plant for its entire life. 
Now fertilizer, on the other hand, I do fertilize these. Uh, these are a green vegetable. Green vegetables, I know it creates a white or purple center, but it is technically brassicas. Brassicas think green, think nitrogen. They love nitrogen. They do need a little bit of the potassium and the phosphorus, but honestly, there's enough in my soil. I know I've tested it that they don't necessarily need that fertilizer to be added. So what I really focus on is the nitrogen rich stuff. So when I first set up this bed, I knew that I was putting nothing but greens, particularly brassica family items into this bed. And so I raked in um, about, I believe it was one pound of nitrogen blood meal fertilizer. It's really more of an amendment into the bed before I ever planted these. That is gonna take time and it's gonna take time to break down. And then when I planted the transplant, I added a couple tablespoons of Nutra Rich. It's something I get from Azure Standard. It's basically a, a chicken manure that has been aged and broken down to a granular form. And so I put that down into the planting hole at the time that I plant these. After that, honestly, I just usually wait. I wait to see if they look like they're not growing fast or if they're not, you know, nice green leaves. I look for things that might tell me that they're struggling because the blood meal and the Nutrimix that I added to it, that should be pretty much what it needs all season. But somewhere in the middle of winter, I generally start to see some traces of, hey, I need some help. <laughs> a little bit of tinging of yellow, a little bit of where the growth is not as steady as it once was. And that's when I'm gonna add another nitrogen rich liquid fertilizer, because this will give it what it needs immediately. And I stick to two different kinds. The first kind is Alaska's fish fertilizer. Not all fish fertilizers are created equal. Um, in terms of nitrogen, I love them all. Don't get me wrong. I love all the different brands. I love Neptune's Harvest. I love Alaska's. I love Down to Earth. Like there's a ton that I really, really like. <laughs> Epsoma has one. Um, I love all of their stuff. But when it comes to my leafy greens, I do stick to the Alaska fish fertilizer because the NPK for that is a 5-1-1. The five stands for the nitrogen ratio. So it is the highest number it means it has the highest amount of nitrogen for that liquid fertilizer where Neptune's harvest or down to earth or something may have a more even number like a four, three, four or something like that. The second one, which is probably going to gross some of you out is urine. <laughs> I use aged urine from our, our, us. <laughs> How do you say that? <laughs> from our house? From us. Um, my husband is our contributor. <laughs> and I dilute that urine 10 to 1. Mix that together and then I only water the soil. I do not water the green leaves or the head or over top. I make it a point very carefully just to water the soil. And the reason for that is I do plan sometimes to eat these leaves cauliflower, broccoli, um, all the kale family really has really, really yummy leaves to eat. And I don't really want urine to be on this. In fact, I don't want fish fertilizer to be on this either because essentially I am going to be eating that. I have not noticed a lot of pest pressure because I grow my brassicas during the winter. So I saw a little bit of pest pressure right when they went into the ground back in September or October with the cutworms and a little bit with some other worms that like to chew on the leaves. But once the weather starts to cool down at night, they basically disappear. And so I actually don't treat my plants in any way. I don't I mean, in general, I don't really treat for pest pressure. The only thing I've ever really treated is pickle worms and because I get a significant amount of them and it, it's kind of a challenge for me. So I do use spinocide and spinos, spinocide, spinocide would work also in the event that you had a bunch of holes in your leaves from worms um, because it is a naturally occurring bacteria that when sprayed, it basically cr causes the worms to stop eating and then they die off. It takes a few days to work, um, so you won't see like immediate on contact uh, result, but within a couple days they're gone. But if you're in like an area that's more south of me and you still have a significant amount of pest pressure, you might notice that your leaves have a lot more holes in them. And if that is a 
cosmetic issue that you don't like your leaves to have holes in them, you can certainly use spinocide. Um, I would just encourage you to focus on doing that in the evenings because spinocide does kill everything. All caterpillars, all worms, some flying insects, it can hurt our bee population. So just use your judgment to do it as minimally as possible about once a month. But if you don't mind a few holes in the leaves, maybe you're not gonna consume every bit of leaf that's here, which I won't. I always produce way more leaves than I, my family will eat. A couple of bites is really not a big deal. It's just a little unsightly. It will not affect the growth of the head of the cauliflower or even the broccoli. It's not gonna bother that. It, they're mainly here to eat the leaves. So a few little holes, they get to eat, we get to eat, everyone wins. If you've gotten to this point, then you know that eventually, after a nice long waiting period, sometimes three or four months, your cauliflower will start to form a head. And it's gonna form that head way down here in the center of the cauliflower plant. And it's gonna start to have leaves that kind of fold over each other. Well, eventually those leaves will start to open up and you'll see the cauliflower head, the beautiful white cauliflower head. And it's gonna look tiny at first. Give it a lot of nitrogen fertilizer at that point. It will help it completely grow as big as possible. Now let me share with you a little bit of a bonus tip, which is how to keep the cauliflower heads pristine white. There's one step that you have to do with cauliflower that you don't necessarily have to do with broccoli or any of the other brassica families, and that is cover the heads. And what do I mean by that? When you start to see the white part of the head of the cauliflower showing, what starts to happen is the sun starts to reflect on it, and it does cause the heads to become discolored. They might look yellow, they might look kind of brownish, they might just not look appealing. Totally edible, completely edible, there's nothing wrong with them. But if you're aiming for a nice white looking head, the best thing that you can do is take the outer leaves, like so, and wrap something around them. I've seen people use twine, um, they use clothespin hangers. I use tomato clips. Uh, whatever I can get around to hold the plant's leaves together around that head, that's exactly what I leave, use. It does not hurt any of the leaves of the plants to do this, and what it does is it protects the head of that cauliflower from getting all of those sun rays, and it keeps the cauliflower super white because of it. Now, the downside of doing this is you are gonna have to open it and check it. If you don't open it and check it from time to time, you might miss your window of harvesting, which is what happened to me. <laughs> I had a cauliflower, I thought, oh, it's got a couple more weeks before it's gonna be ready. I forgot about it. It was kind of tucked in under other plants. I had covered the head and it kind of blended in with all the other brassicas that I was growing. And so I forgot. And when I opened it up to look at it, what I found was a head that had clearly started to bolt. This head is completely edible. It, it, it's not really pretty, but it is completely edible. It's probably gonna start taking on a taste that's a little more grassier, a little tiny bit more bitter, a little more stringy, um, but it's still completely edible and, and roasted, you would never notice that taste. Raw, you'd probably notice it. But once it starts to do this thing where the, the, the head starts to separate and you have pieces of it kind of poking up and out, it means that it's trying to go to flower or go to seed. And basically the plant is trying to reproduce itself. So when it gets to that point, you really are aiming to try to harvest it before it does that separation, before parts of the cauliflower head start to grow larger or out or up. Um, as opposed to the whole head. You want the whole head to be uniformed and tight together. Once you start to see just the tiniest bit of separation, you need to harvest it. If you wait any longer, what's gonna happen is what happened to me and they are gonna get a little bit beyond what their ideal state is. Now I know many of you are like, well, mine started to separate and it was only two inches wide. <laughs> That can happen. It all depends on the variety. Different varieties produce different size heads. 
and different climate conditions can produce different size heads. If a plant feels stressed from the heat, for example, it may decide that it's going to create this tiny little head and it's going to immediately push that head to become seed or flower so that it can reproduce itself because it feels the heat and it feels the heat and it tells itself, hey, summer is coming. I need to reproduce myself and get out of here. So since that can happen, you really want to focus on your varieties, heat tolerant varieties, varieties that don't mind these huge swings in temperatures so that that way it doesn't um, cue the plant that it needs to start packing up and getting out of here. So there you have it. Everything you ever wanted to know about cauliflower from seed to harvest. I hope you had a great time hanging out with me today. If you did, make sure to head down and hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. Happy gardening, guys.